Eric and Susan Hiscock hold a very special place in yachting history and cruising history because Eric was the editor of a yachting magazine in England in the 30s and uh, he started doing small boat voyages with his partner Susan who became his wife at a time when he was very careful not to say that the partner was female and he didn't reveal that until his second book that he'd been off with Susan Slater before they were married uh, and he introduced this idea of taking a very small boat out on long voyages competently, not as a stunt, but as a really interesting way to explore. And other people had sailed bigger boats around the world, uh, uh, but not many. At the time when Susan and Eric set off on Wander 3 to go around the world the first time, there probably wasn't a dozen people who had circumnavigated in small yachts. This was 1950s. Yeah, early 1950s. And so Eric then came back from his voyages, the first voyages, and wrote books about being competent, going sailing, and the adventure being the people he met along the way, not the sailing. Prudence was a word that they used, and it's not a word that people talk about lately, but to us it was the right word for voyaging on small boats. So their first books um, influenced many people by introducing them to the ideas of how to outfit boats and how to sail them with seamanship-like attitudes. You know, the Hiscox had a series of boats named Wanderer. What was special about Wanderer 3? Well, I think they, a lot of people could identify with a boat that size. It was 30 feet, and I think it weighed about 18,000 pounds. And uh, a lot of people could see themselves earning enough money to buy a boat like that and go sailing. The it was a modest boat, in other words. Yeah. Wanderers, the wanderers that the Hiscox had, when Susan and I were talking, well, actually when Eric, Susan, and I were all talking about their life, they said Wanderer 3 was always their absolute favorite boat. It was the boat they had had the most fun on the boat that they felt most confident about at all times, and the boat that people liked the most. Eric and Susan's film showing Wanderer's voyage around the world was definitely the first voyaging film I had ever seen. Whether it was the first one made, I, don't know. I have no idea. But it was the first one made by the BBC. So basically, Eric and Susan had come back from their first voyage on Wander, and they'd done a series of talks at yacht clubs around the country, and very well received, because he puts on a charming show. He has a British turn of wit, and BBC approached them, and Eric and offered them a nice, you know, a nice amount of money if they could actually accomplish this. They gave Eric 4,000 feet of film and a wind-up camera, and a bit of coaching. Now, Eric is a highly organized human being. He um, created a script. Not exactly, you never know what's gonna happen sailing, but the shots that he particularly wanted to show, raising sails, lowering sails, anchoring what life was down, on down below. And uh, he shot the footage with a wind-up camera. And because lighting was very hard in those days, cameras were much more sensitive, he would do a shot looking one way, then he and Susan would make meticulous drawings of where people's feet were, where their hands were, what they were wearing, what sails might be behind them, and they'd wait till late in the day so they could shoot the other way to get the close-ups. So they made it a real project for the three years of their voyage, and when they came back, they had took it to the BBC, they had a good voyage, interesting times, and they took it to the BBC, and the BBC used 3,700 feet of the film. That's how almost all of it. Almost all of it. And created a movie which was shown on the BBC four times, and he said it came out exactly the way he expected. Eric's very dogmatic, and he, he had it laid out for them. He says, this is what sailors will like. Instead of payment, Eric was given the full rights to the film. And he went around the country and eventually around the world showing the film to yachting art groups. And we saw it for the first time in um, Newport Beach at the Lido Theater. Oh, it would have been 
Was it shown then? Yeah, I think it was in uh, when we were just building Taliesin, and that's when he told us we had to come down and meet him down in New Zealand. And that's what influenced our choice of directions when we finished launching our boat. We said, he said, let's finally rendezvous and spend some more time together again. Did the Hiscox share any filmmaking tips with you? Did they influence your approach to film? I would say the Hiscox influenced our filmmaking very highly in that uh, by sharing the talk about how they had made sure to get shots both ways, by reminding us that people wanted to know where they were on the boat, if possible. And they also told us that, you remember, if you ever get involved in filming, you give up cruising. You either film or you cruise. And so they used to divide it up. They'd take some times when they put the filming away completely for a bit, and other times when that was a filming day. Has that been uh, your approach to filmmaking, in that um, you will do the shooting, the filming while you're on board, and then bring it back to edit it once your sale's done? We, We've got other people to edit it. We, we tried to do yeah. it, it was too, too difficult. <laughs> too difficult, we did try it. I think that Larry and I shoot footage that we think could be useful. We've rarely gone out with a complete script to do a story, but then we've come back and said, well, here's the narrative we were trying to do, and we've done a narrative, and fortunately had usually enough of the footage shot. But we see, we, we were much more relaxed about it and did our shooting over a much longer time. We weren't setting out to show a voyage around the world. We were setting out to show interesting incidents. That if we missed something on a voyage, it wasn't, it wasn't the end of the world. But if they missed something, there would be a gap in the story. But they if we sailed across the Indian Ocean and we missed something, too bad. Too bad, yeah. <laughs> we'll come up with the story afterwards and look at the film footage we have and do the story afterwards. Our whole writing and filming career has been different in that way in that we never set out to be writers, we never set out to be photographers or filmmakers. We went and did things that were really enjoyable and we came back and we said, ooh, I'll bet people would like to read about that or see that on film. And so I think it's made it a lot easier for us. Not more fun. Wanderer 3 influenced some of the choices we made for our boat. We used their ground tackle recommendations straight down the line and they were right, absolutely perfect. We also read about the stoves they'd used and decided we would never have a kerosene stove on board. We wanted more luxurious accommodation. They were quite Spartan in their accommodation. They never had a double bunk, but that's another story I could tell you about. <laughs> Soon after Eric died, Susan sailed her very first single-handed voyage, 65 miles to come and visit us at Kawao Island in New Zealand. And the editor of Sail Magazine at that time was a woman named Patience Wales, and she had just come on a voyage down through the Pacific and come to visit us. And so we had three women of three generations sitting downstairs in our little guest room, chatting about sailing and people. And at a certain point, I got very bold, and I said, Susan, I've been on three of your boats, and I've never seen a double bunk. Uh, this that implied that, you know, there, you know, there wasn't anything going on. And she says, well, Lynn, we're British, <laughs> but there were times when we'd be in port for a few days and we'd have a desire. So we'd set sail and we'd reach out on a beam reach for a day and a half. And then we'd heave to, and we'd put Beethoven's Sixth Symphony on our little stereo and get out a bottle of champagne and enjoy each com other's company on the cabin sole. <laughs> what was your relationship like with Eric and Susan? <laughs> we started out as groupies, and uh, when we were delivering a boat from Mexico one year, we came into the San Diego Yacht Club, and they were tied there. And um, we ran, ran over and said, oh, we'd really like to get to know you. Can we take you out for drinks? And they said, well, if you come back tomorrow evening, we'll have some drinks here. And we came back the next evening and they were really gracious hosts. And we told them all about this 24 foot sailboat we were sailing around on. And they looked at this 60 foot, 180 ton power boat we just brought into the marina and they said, uh-huh. So we met Eric and Susan over the next several years in 
three or four different ports, always when we were del delivering a boat. And they were always gracious to us, and they always kind of laughed, and we'd show them a picture of our little boat. Well, many years later, we came back across the North Pacific. It was about 10 years of voyaging, and uh, we were invited to a friend's island up in near Bouchard Gardens up in the Canadian islands. And they were so excited because their parents were good friends with the Hiscox, and the Hiscox were tied at their dock. So you can imagine, we spruced our little boat up as we were sailing in. We figured the chart out. We got it all ready. We were going to do the most perfect sailing approach you could imagine. For you know, These were our heroes. So we came sailing around the corner of this island. And there on the dock stood Eric and Susan, both of them absolutely ignoring us and looking out to sea. And we sailed alongside the dock. Perfect landing. Didn't trip when I jumped off the boat to put the line around the cleat. And I walked over and I said, what are you looking for? And Eric looked at me and said, the mothership. <laughs> we became good friends during that. Uh, we spent two weeks tied at the same dock. And we had just written our first book and came back to the United States to find that people actually had read it. We'd written quite a few articles up till then. But Eric said to us, you know, you're coming into a new phase of your life. I've read some of what you've written, and uh, you're writing things that people need to hear. Uh, but there's things you need to know about the life you're now embarking on that maybe we can share with you. And they were gave us some excellent advice about enjoying being mentors to other sailors and yet not letting it take over your life so you felt uncomfortable. And uh, he was a self-contained human being. And people were constantly rolling up and wanting to have his time, his attention. And he wanted to keep some sense of himself. So he told me a little trick that I had realized he'd played on us. Literally dozens of people will row up to us when we come into a new anchorage and say, can we come on board or can we you know, get to know you? And Eric said, the trick is when people approach you, unless you really you find the boat they sailed in and just fascinates you or, or it's just in your mood, you say, could you come back tomorrow? If they say, no, I'm really too busy, then you know they're trying to shove you into their lives and not respecting yours. Fit you, in, fit you into their, your, their schedule. So he said to us, it really, I've really found that anyone who says, I'd really like to do that, I'll see you tomorrow, and shows up with a bottle of wine, there are people you're gonna like. Tell so, them about the, the uh, guest book. You want a little Hiscock story? Sure. You gotta remember, they were Brits. Eric and Susan were a much more, came from a much formal yachting tradition than we did, we're Californian style. And, most yachtsmen carry guest books, not just to get uh, signatures for fun, but so they can keep track of their friends and write back to them or talk about them by name afterwards. And in British tradition, the way you get rid of guests at the end of an evening is you pull out the guest book and ask them to sign. And that's a signal that you were ready to call the evening to end. Time to go. It's kind of civilized. Yeah, it's kind of civilized because, you know, we have a less polite way of doing that. I, uh, Larry says to me, Lynn, I think it's time to go to bed so these nice people can go home. But, <laughs> 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 but uh, Eric and Susan sailed into a place in the islands and this young couple rode over and just utterly charming and cute as can be and pretty little boat. And they invited Eric and Susan to come for dinner the next night to come for dinner that night, and Eric and Susan says, we could do it tomorrow night if that would be okay. So the couple, the, Eric and Susan said, they watched them scrubbing their boat, getting ready. It was just a, a hilarious to watch them getting ready. So they rode over at the appropriate time, for, you know, nicely decked out and ready for an evening with a couple that looked charming. They went on board, they were welcomed on board, they were shown down below, they sit down, the gal gives them a drink immediately, and then says, will you sign my guest book? <laughs> so Eric said to me, I did the appropriate thing, we signed it, we thanked them very much for the drink, and we got up and we left. And they looked so perplexed. <laughs>
We just speak a common language, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> we, we sailed to New Zealand to rendezvous with the Hiscocks. We rendezvoused in the Bay of Islands. And um, he said, you know, we do need photographs. You do, I do. So the beautiful bay here. Sailing photographs. He said, you sail around me first. I'll anchor, you sail around me. And we did. And he took some very nice photographs. And then we anchored, and he sailed around us. But it worried us, because Eric's eyesight is very limited. And he started sailing closer and closer. And on the third pass, he passed our bowsprit with only two or three feet between his rigging and our boat. And afterwards, I said to Susan, I was a little worried about how close he was. And she says, oh, I had my foot on his foot. I just tap it, give him a bit of direction. <laughs> she said, we wanted good photographs. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about the current owners of Wanderer 3? Tiaz Matson no. and Kiki Erickson? We met Tiaz and Kiki at Eric's funeral in New Zealand. And a uh, charming couple, boat builder, and he wanted, he bought Wanderer 3 and was fixing her up and she needed some extensive repairs because she'd been owned by others who hadn't cared for her. Well, she had iron floors and they should be replaced because they were wasting away. Yeah. And he cast bronze ones to go all the way through. He did the a boat's really good, good shape. Yeah, he did a lovely job. And those two absolutely loved the boat. And uh, they love the memory and history of the Hiscocks. They've taken the boat much more exotic and dangerous places down into the Antarctic areas. And one time when Kiki had to fly home to be with her family. They came and sailed into our cove in New Zealand where we have a home base. And Tees ended up working for us because we had five boats that we were fixing all at one time because we, we were earning some extra cruising funds at our little boat yard in New Zealand. And um, these two, two boat builders started talking about wooden boats and by God they went off into their own little world. It was very enjoyable. And they've given that boat an amazing history on top of the good history she already had. I suppose that practically everybody who owns a small boat has a desire, a dream, you might say, to sail around the world. Well, uh, Susan and I are two of those fortunate individuals who've made that dream come true. In our 30-foot sloop, Wanderer 3, we did sail around the world. And this is the story of that voyage. Mm -hmm. 